Well, hello everyone and welcome to Lymphedema Wales. So this afternoon we're going to be chatting to you about some really innovative programmes that we've got happening. And I've been told, if there are any finance people watching, that there's going to be a few graphic photographs. Tim has told me to tell you, but any clinicians, you know what you're going to expect. So Lymphedema Wales, so I'm, I should introduce myself. I'm Melanie Thomas, I'm the clinical director for Lymphedema in Wales. And what we're going to do is talk to you about lymphedema. Now, lymphedema isn't something special. That's all it is, is chronic edema, so it's swelling, that has been present for three months. And if it's gone past that three months, what it just means is the lymphatic system has failed and it is lymphedema. So don't think it's something special, it's just swelling. And as you can see, swelling can occur in any part of the body and it can occur in the young. The youngest referral we were ever uh, referred was four days old. Our oldest patient is 104. So it, it's across the board and you can see legs, arms, faces, genitals, breasts and stomachs, if they're extremely large, can get very edematous. In Wales there are seven lymphedema services and there are a national team and it's the national team that are going to be telling you about some of our innovations today as well. Next slide please. So where have we been with lymphedema? So we started off, gosh, in the early 2000s, but what we found was that there was loads and loads of patients who couldn't actually get into our services because we were a cancer only service. And in fact, we even discriminated a little bit more. So for argument's sake, in one particular area in Wales, you could only get in if you were a woman who'd had breast cancer or gynae cancer. So it was that bad. So back in 2009, we wrote a Welsh Government lymphedema strategy and in 2011, we had a million pounds given to us to end the inequity. And a million sounds a huge amount of money, it did then, but nowadays it really wasn't. The prevalence was two per thousand and actually now it's nearer seven per thousand. So lots of things happened. We did lots of innovations. We had project money, proved the worth. We tried to change the skill mix. So if we had a band seven leaving, we would get two band fours in. But eventually we couldn't do any more and the breaches were increasing. So we had long time before we saw our new patients and the gaps between the capacity and demand were just growing. And sadly, there are consequences to lymphedema that you'll hear about today. Things like falls, cellulitis, wounds, things that cost a lot of money to the patient, but also to the NHS. The other thing is we didn't really know what was true valuable to our patients. We thought we know, but we don't really know what's in the mind of a patient unless you've got that condition. So we wanted to find out more about our reported outcomes. So all of this happened and lo and behold, 2019, I met somebody from Welsh Government and he said, Mel, you need to do a value-based lymphedema business case. And that's what we did. And on that note, I'm now going to pass over to Tim Kelland, who is the Assistant Director of Finance in the Financial Delivery Unit. So over to you, Tim. OK, um, thank you very much, Mel. Um, yes, I had a phone call from Alan Brace, who was the then head of finance in Welsh Government, uh, who basically said, I've listened to Dr Mel Thomas speaking. She has a business case that's a no brainer, but we need to put a bit of formality around it. Would I work closely with Mel to develop the business case for the NHS in Wales to consider? So if we go to the next slide. So first of all, uh, the baseline position that was presented to me, we had growing demand, inappropriate staff workloads, variation in practice, variation in provision, knowledge gaps of clinicians, inefficient procurement models, resulting in long waits for patients, patients being missed, avoidable use of NHS resources, a postcode lottery, and harm and poor outcomes for our patients. Um, next slide, please. So we developed a business case which, which was to look at addressing the backlog, developing a sustainable service, improving the education of our stakeholders, improving procurement practice and developing best practice standard clinical pathways. And that's what we've been working on um, with the objective of leading to uh, what I listed there, sustainable service, knowledge gaps, competent workforce, knowledgeable uh, competent workforce, improving patient outcomes, 
uh, release of significant NHS capacity and uh, what has finance people left to hear cash release in savings. So if I can move to the next slide. The business case here is the, uh, the value triangle. Uh, and before what we had, we were spending significant amounts of money on the low value activities because we weren't caring for our patients properly. We had patients ending up uh, with cellulitis, sometimes in intensive care. Uh, we had loads of admittances to GP practices inappropriately, attendances at A&E, and probably the biggest one of all, uh, wound care management uh, and our nurse district nursing um, community having to spend vast amounts of time caring for patients with wounds which they probably didn't need. Um, after the investment, we spent more investment on education, appropriate appliances and timely assessments and we'll talk a little bit about that in detail uh, soon uh, and we've already shrunk uh, the, the, the amount of spend we've had to put into the low value activities. Um, and ultimately, whilst I think this is a perfect, as far as I'm concerned, this is the perfect value uh, business case, uh, we improve patient outcomes and we actually uh, reduce the overall system um, spend uh, to do that. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, now, when I was asked to do the business case and I met with Mel and the team, um, I was presented with uh, what I, my father always told me if something looked too good to be true, it probably wasn't. Um, however, um, some of the assertions being made by the lymphedema uh, team were uh, with an investment, little investment, we could some make some massive savings and uh, massively improve patient outcomes. Um, and you can see there's a variety of savings that we had identified, um, some of which were um, not cash releasing. For example, we were going to reduce the amount of attendance to GB practices. We were going to reduce the inappropriate attendance in A&E. There's no money to be saved there, but as you know, we'll all know now, our GP practices are, are virtually falling over because they're struggling. Our A&Es are, are, are struggling. So the value of us reducing the burden on them uh, cannot be underestimated and it cannot be, uh, a value can't be put on that. Um, however, I, I like the focus on the district nurse attendances. When we, in the business case, um, I only put in that um, if we invest in lymphedema service properly, we could reduce the amount of attendances by district nurses by 10%. Um, when Mel first told me what she believed uh, the impact of the service could have on district nurses, that figure was around 40%. Now, that means like four out of every hours of every district nurse could be uh, re reduced if we invest properly in this. It really did sound too good to be true. So I didn't just um, accept those figures. I looked at, first of all, I went to Google to have a look how reliable that could be. And what was fascinating was as soon as I went to Google, no matter where I went, I ended back at Lymphedema Services Wales and Mel, Dr. Mel Thomas and the wonderful work they're doing. So I, I, I really didn't get it there. So what I did, uh, and I even surprised Alan Brace here, I emailed the chief nurse at Welsh Government and I asked, I, I basically said, look, I've had this assertion uh, made that they could save this time. Do you really believe this is true in your professional opinion? To which the response I got was interesting. She went away to three different hospital uh, colleagues she knew in England, one in Nottingham, one in the Royal Free, and I think the other one was University College London. And the feedback she came to me was actually, it may be more than 40%. Uh, however, when I designed, I did the business case, I did on the grounds of affordability, we didn't need to put in 40%, we put 10%, it was a no brainer anyway. But you can see potentially even across way the 10% reduction was going to deliver significant savings uh, there. So um, if I go to the next slide, I think that's me handing over. Yes, that's me now handing over to Karen, who's going to tell you a little bit about the On the Ground Educator Programme, which is part of the, the business case we supported. Thank you, Tim. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Karen Morgan. I'm National Lymphedema Education and Research Lead in Wales. I'm a nurse by background. 
passionate about legs and wounds and have looked after wounds for most of my career as a nurse. So fell into the lymphedema service in 2006 and never left really. Um, so lymphedema, as Mel said, um, is chronic edema and chronic edema, if it's present in three months, is a failure of the lymphatics. So the on the ground project is um, a pilot that we came back up with back in 2015 and put a business uh, a business case towards the um, efficiency, health efficiency board to pilot it. And the results that we went back to Welsh Government were with from that pilot. But as Mel said, I'm pleased to say the value based um, business case supported this in all of the health boards. So I'm going to present some of the data and the work that we've done. So if you could go to the next slide for me, please. So basically we've created, um, uh, we know that we need to increase awareness and confidence and competence about, first of all, recognising edema, chronic edema, and secondly, referring early. We have lots of patients that are referred to our service late on in their journey. These wounds don't happen overnight. They happen um, over a period of time. They will have been managed for quite a period of time. And maybe the chronic edema hasn't been considered as part of that pathway. The other thing to say is that although chronic edema, anything that's been there for longer than three months, that chronic edema doesn't occur overnight either. And the pictures that you can see on these slides, they've had edema for quite a significant time. So what we're trying to do in lymphedema is take very much a proactive approach. So we don't want these patients referred as late as they are being referred. We wanted to get out and educate the community nurses, the practice nurses, um, ensure they had an underlying knowledge which would increase their competence, uh, confidence first in identifying it and then refer into the service sooner. So we created a, a work based unit an agorid work based unit and encouraged all the nurses to come to this session, but they couldn't be released because they were busy managing all those wounds that Tim has talked about just now. So we decided to take the education to them. So the on the ground educator role is specifically about that. It's about delivering education on the ground, working with the nurses day in, day out, increasing their competence um, and enabling them to be able to identify who needs to be involved with those patients and, and gain them the confidence to apply that compression sooner rather than later and stop mopping up really. So the main aim is to upskill and increase competence. The objective is to reduce the risks of secondary complications such as uh, falls and cellulitis and complex wounds and all the things that um, Mel introduced at the beginning of the session. So if I can have the next slide, please. So currently this is data from two health boards. So the on the ground clinical educator programme is currently in um, Swansea Bay and um, Betsy and also how will that and we're just about to go out to post in Cardiff and Vale but this is data from two of the health boards. Um, total of the patients that we've seen is 600. Um, the wound clinic patients that we've seen in those areas is 316 and you can read the data there as to the activity. The categories of edema that we've seen have ranged from complex with a wound, which would be an edema that's been there for a significant amount of time. And then we've also picked up patients that are at risk of edema. They have mild, moderate, severe or complex edema without a wound. So this is showing the value of us being out there and what we've done. So 69% of the patients that we saw out of those 600 had edema, but only 20% of them were known to a lymphedema service. So there's an unmet need there. 70% of the patients were overweight, 28% were severe uh, mobility issues. There was a history of falls, um, severe pain, because you can see from the images that those legs will cause that pain. And 65% of the patients that we saw were, were in the vulnerable category with frailty scores. What did we do? So straight away, when we go in, we work with the nurses. 49% of those patients, we've altered or increased the compression. So we're giving them optimum clinically effective compression to reduce their edema and heal their wounds. We've changed their bandages to compression garments, so that reduces time, which I'll expand on a little bit more as we go through. Or we've actually commenced compression garments. All the evidence suggests now that you apply compression as soon as possible, but still there's a resistance in practice to do this. And this is where the role of the on the ground clinical educator is essential. It's about that confidence and that drive uh, to actually support those staff to, to, to put that evidence base into practice. And 20% of the patients we saw remained the same. Now, this is interesting for me because when we first started and we started collecting the data, um, 
it was 7% remained the same. This increased to 14% at quarter four, at the second quarter. But actually now we're coming into the third quarter, it's 20%. And that just identifies to me that we are changing practice. We are encouraging people to actually commence that compression sooner. Um, so it's, you know, it's really great to see that journey actually and, and to report that back. So if I can have the next slide, please. So the changes to treatment. So again, this shows over those periods and how it changes. And again, it reinforces the fact that these on the ground clinical educators are embedded in that change and it will remain a sustained change. It will sustain and stay with them. So as I said, 7% at the beginning remained the same up to 14 to 26%. So we had actually changed in the treatment less as the programme is developing. Obviously, staff will leave and come and that might fluctuate, but actually you're, you're ensuring that you've got a, um, a, a good informed workforce there. Went into garments, so you can see that there was a bit of a spike in July, but we're still at 21%. Bandages to garments is now gone up to 28%, and that has huge implications on um, those non-cash releasing, but essential to freeing up district nurse time and then increase the compression. And this maps the remain the same. So if you see, we were increasing a lot of the compression when we first started, now we're increasing less. So that again, to me, um, confirms really what we see in practice, that the confidence in, is growing around that, which is the key part of this programme. So if you go to the next slide, please. So we collect patient reported outcome measures um, and we've created a LIMPROM, which Dr. Uh, uh, Marie will talk about later, but we also compared that with the EQ5D5L and the health score. So how, what impact does it have on the patient? Yes, we can uh, cash release, we can improve practice for nurses, but what's the impact on those patients? And you can see that every single prom has improved. So the first prom is when we first met the patients and then the second prom is two month review later. So we, we start a treatment and then we go back and review that treatment to see what the impact is and what the costing is around that. And even the health scores have improved for those patients, which, which is extremely powerful. If you move to the next slide for me, please. So the education, a big part of this, it isn't a community lymphedema service. It is a community, um, it's a it's a on the ground clinical lymphedema educator. And the whole ethos is to upskill staff to be able to recognise um, those patients much sooner and feel competent uh, to, to, to manage them. So we are really focusing on upskilling healthcare assistants because we, we need to use the delegation framework that's within the NMC so that actually we can work smarter. So we're able to delegate to um, a healthcare assistant rather than a registered nurse having to go out and do it for a specific patient. We're improving levels of knowledge in chronic edema um, and we're actually now have influenced wound clinics to have have compression garments on the shelf so that we've got training associated with that so we can actually get people in garments a lot sooner. So if we go to the next slide please. So the benefit realisation. So as I said to you, the data two months prior to our intervention and then the data that we capture two months after. And it's clear to see really that, you know, you are releasing community wound nurse tissue viability contacts. So you're freeing them up to see the more complex patients and, you know, the GP contacts, the sustainability around the GPs, we're freeing those appointments up. Emergency department, again, you can see that, and the cellulitis, there's a reduction and falls. So the whole aim is that we have a competent and confident workforce force, and we work more effectively and efficient, efficiently. And even the marginal gains from a band three applying the bandaging instead of a band five, um, you know, over a period of a year, that works out that you can reduce um, not the cash release in, but free up the time of um, 93,000. So it does pay for itself. And 40% of the patients that we've seen were discharged. So when Tim was talking earlier about the amount of patients that we could have an impact on and what we could release, we are going above and beyond that really. And I think for me, it's the, the investment in the staff as well, which is powerful. If I have the next slide, please. 
So the finance realisation, in a nutshell, looking at all the figures, um, obviously you'll have recording of this, but if I can just highlight to you that the overall cost pre and post, so it's 1,235,000 avoided per patient over two months, but the hard cash of that is 290, and that's only 189 patients. So if we multiplied that by all of the patients that we have in the whole of Wales, then actually we, you know, we are um, providing value base. So if I can go to the last slide, I believe. Yeah, so just to let you know, we're moving forwards. We're pushing it forward as much as we can. We want a proactive approach to chronic edema. And really now I no longer present and say, you can't afford not to do this. You need to do this. It costs too much. I now say it costs more not to employ the posts, which I really think is a true summary of it all. And um, so it's live in four of the health boards. However, two of them are permanent funding. So thank you very much. Um, whistle stop tour of that. I'd like to introduce Dr. Marie Gay Waters and look forward to some questions later. Thank you. Hi, good Hi. afternoon all. Thank you very much for our uh, time here with you today. So I'm one of the researchers in the national team and I'm here today mainly to talk about our LIMPROM, our patient reported outcome measure for patients with lymphedema. Next slide please. So I'm sure you've heard throughout the various sessions in the week about what PROMs are. Um, and if you think back to Mel's very, Dr. Mel's very first slide with all the images, you can have um, some thoughts about how lymphedema might impact on the individual. Next clip, please. So we have patients coming into clinic um, with their swelling and one of the sort of key concerns for them um, could be something other than the actual presentation of the swelling. So we have this lady, Megan, who has had multiple um, visits for wounds and, and district nursing services um, and routinely come into clinic. Um, she may well be measured for stockings, but actually when asked what mattered to her, it was her independence and the pain that she'd been experiencing in her legs meant that she wasn't getting out in a car and her quality of life was therefore compromised. Um, so going back um, historically, lymphedema services have been collecting outcome measures with patients at each uh, patient contact. And that was based on um, sort of collaboration with patients and clinicians to find out what outcomes matter to patients the most. Next slide, please. So as um, both Karen and Mel have pre previously alluded to, we've got outcome measures, we've got LIMPROM, um, and LIMPROM was based on what has been traditionally collected by the lymphedema services, the outcomes that matters to patients, and it's now been extracted into a standalone document um, covering 13 items over a physical, social and mental health domain. Uh, Karen showed you the slides earlier about the changes in scores, so for each item, patients are asked to report um, using a stress thermometer like scale, so 0 to 10, where 10 is the worst manageable impact of that that, that item on them. Um, so we presented LIMPROM briefly and the steps towards validation in the Value and Health Week last year in 2020, and that's still ongoing with a publication penned in the end of this year, hopefully. Um, so traditionally, LIMPROM was collected um, as a paper um, based PROM. Um, which um, presented particular challenges in the recent pandemic times. Um, so we had the opportunity now to look at digitising LIMPROM. Next slide, please. So this enabled us now to make sure we were getting our, our PROMs out to patients quite quickly, um, which provides us the opportunity now to think about how we can collect outcome measures from patients who are newly referred into the service. Um, so it enabled us to send out a PROM within a day after a referral being received by the lymphedema service and being sent out two weeks before each planned contact with a clinician. In having it available um, digitally, we were able to build in um, logic capabilities of the form to reduce burden on patients answering questions if they needn't. Um, we were able to add in um, demographic sections and that this would reduce then the time within um, clinical space, the admin effort of, of completing PROMs, which were previously done on paper, primarily in the, the waiting area. So that will allow then within their appointment time to focus on care, but also to focus on what matters to the patient. 
um, and I'm going to go through on the next few slides how we've rolled out this digital Limprom um, in the health boards in Wales, each with um, PDSA cycles within to ensure that we are achieving what we hope to set out to achieve. Next slide, please. So one of the key aims of collecting PROMs, um, so lymphedema is a chronic disease, as, as, you, as you should know by now. Um, uh, one of the key aims was to inform direct patient care. So in enabling triage, um, speaking with therapists a couple of weeks ago, um, we've had some feedback along the lines of previously, you know, they would always see this patient within two weeks. That was what they've always done. But when asked, swelling wasn't their main concern. So it's it's changed our um, approach to triaging patients. It's, it's provided the patient voice alongside the clinical knowledge and also the referring information. But then in follow up care, it's been used to identify um, areas of care. We've got a, a chap who came in and their prom actually identified that they had um, problems with their feet, which wouldn't necessarily have been otherwise identified. We've had clinicians feeding back that um, patients are coming in ready for their measurements and then and now, now they're being asked to um, think about actually what matters to them and their, their, their proms. Um, so for some patients, it's empowering them, it's enabling them to really take a lead in their care. And moving forward, there's potential opportunity to look at our caseload work and to look at PROMs and who will benefit most from face to face contact and who potentially would be better served being discharged from the service with an open door policy. Next slide, please. So, so far we've got three health boards. Um, I'm just going to briefly present data from two health boards. Um, so we've now, now nearly got nearly 5,000 PROMs, but I'm going to present on just over 4,000. Um, our response rate um, is quite a crude information at the moment. It's simply the number of um, links sent out to complete PROMs and the links are sent out um, via email or text. So as long as a patient has a mobile number or an email on their record, they were able to receive a link. And then it's the number of links that have been clicked on and then submitted by the patient. On average, most uh, are completing quite quickly within the three days. So if you think back, I mentioned that they're sent out their proms two weeks before their appointment. Um, and if they don't complete it before their appointment, they get one reminder. We, I'll come on my last slide about PREMS. We were collecting um, PREMS throughout and when asked if, lim if the limb prom helped them record their symptoms, 75% um, felt that it did help them identify how lymphedema affects them. Next slide, please. So of um, one of the things I mentioned about uh, having digital limb prom was that we were able to add demographic information. So I'm going to report on for the majority of items over 4000 um, proms being returned. But um, in March, we updated the demographic section. So things around um, self-reported identity and location of lymphedema only reflects just over 2000 proms. So the majority of proms are being completed by, by females. But we do have a proportion of men and um, the location of lymphedema typically being reported by patients is lower limb, so their leg or their feet being affected. But we do in fact have patients completing with um, different areas of lymphedema being affected. And we've got an across the age range sort of um, capture of responses. So um, one of the things that we picked up with clinicians is in our workshops is along um, digital literacy and, and assuming who or who might not have access to digital services and who would like access, um, we've got a good representation across, across the board there. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that one of the main aims of LIMPROM is direct patient care. So patients are now able to report on and also track their, their PROMs over time. And the three key items that um, keep cropping up for patients is shopping for clothes or shoes. So if you think back to some of the slides you saw earlier, some of the pictures that, that Mel had up, um, think about as a person how you might feel in trying to find clothes or shoes that fit those altered shapes. Body image is adversely affected and heaviness. Um, interesting, at the end of um, Limprom, there's a free tech section 
and we have found that actually patients have really used it digitally so it's enabled them to describe their lymphedema and their outcomes in more detail and identify things that we didn't necessarily expect so things about how lymphedema might affect their sleep and their families next slide please so these are sort of almost just tasters now my next few slides about what we can do now with this data there's lots more to do and and um this is just a sort of an overview. So we've got all this data, we've got ideas of who's completing them. So we're able to think about is the experience of lymphedema, are the outcomes different by cohorts? So by identity, we've got the average score of Limprom. So if we think there are 13 items, maximum score is 10. So maximum score could be 130. Um, females typically report um, a higher burden of lymphedema. Um, and I'll come through this on my last slide. None of this is offering answers. It's probably putting more questions out than answers, but it's uh, a really fantastic way to start thinking about the value of the service we offer to patients. Next slide, please. Um, another slide just to, just to show how things like, so within the items, if we're not some, potentially the scores, it's quite a crude way to look at the impact of PROMS over time. But if you look at the items, things around body image, um, it tends to peak as an issue, looking at the graph on the left, for those in the younger age cohort, and then decrease over time on average, um, whereas things around personal care, they tend to become uh, a chief concern in, in those in the older cohorts. Likewise, the score um, on average uh, changes between the different age groups. Next slide, please. So very exciting times ahead. We've been working with um, THGW and the National Value and Health team to create the lymphedema Limprom dashboard. Um, so this will enable us to visualize the data. And I'm, I'm sure there's been some sessions around dashboards and dashboard works throughout uh, this week. Um, when we've developed it alongside clinicians and we're still collecting feedback about the presentation of data for this, but it will enable us to review um, PROMS at the aggregate level, um, triangulate with data so we can look um, and have better understanding of our cohorts. And it's allowing us to look at changes in PROMS over time, which is a really, really interesting concept, particularly um, with lymphedema being a chronic disease. Um, sorry, the last last bit I was going to mention then is that uh, we've got um, some information from the free text being pulled out so we can um, report back a little bit on the qualitative information that we're getting. And then final slide for me, please. Um, I mentioned Limprem, that's also been sent out digitally. Um, so this is a, a tool for patients to report on their experiences using a five point Likert scale. Um, and it's sent out after each appointment, um, enabling then um, patients to feedback on what went well or what didn't go so well using free text as well. Um, so the, the plans are to also, also put this within a dashboard to drive quality within services. And that's the last of my slides. I'm going to hand you over to Linda Jenkins, who's one of the National Cellulitis Improvement Leads. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, uh, for that. Uh, as Marie said, I'm Linda. I'm from the National Cellulitis Improvement Team. I'm a physiotherapist by background and I've been a member of the uh, National Lymphedema Service since 2016, when I had a, a very significant induction when I was one of the on the ground um, initial educators when we did the pilot project in Cardiff. Um, so I, I have my wings well and truly now in the National Lymphedema Team. So if I can have the, the next slide, please. So I'm sure you've all heard of cellulitis. Um, we knew that cellulitis was a problem in the lymphedema service. We know that a lot of our patients uh, have cellulitis and we know that when they eventually come to us and if we get to see them in the lymphedema service, we can make a significant improvement. We can reduce the risks of them having cellulitis, which hopefully means reducing the likelihood of them ending up in hospital, but has a knock on effect of making them less likely to be off from work, uh, making them feel more in control. Um, and so just as a as a taster here, we know that um, the data, this is Welsh data here, so 37,000 bed days uh, were spent by people in hospital with cellulitis um, in the 2019-2020 uh, year, including in that is the 4,000, um, over 4,000, nearly 5,000 attendances at A&E um, and people seeing consultants, nearly 8,000 uh, consultant episodes and, and a 10 day length of stay at that point. So we know that this is an awful lot of people that are going into hospital with cellulitis and we also know that an awful lot of those people don't just happen once. You know, they don't just have one episode. The evidence would say that if you've had cellulitis once, you're between sort of 10 and 50% chance of having it again subsequently. Um, and that's often because 
the risk factors haven't been addressed, uh, why you've got that cellulitis in the first place. OK, so if I can have the next slide, please. So when we set up this service, when we, when we receive the money from Welsh Government to look at reducing the admissions to hospital and reducing the pressures on secondary care, uh, our intention was to do that by contacting everybody in Wales who'd been given a diagnosis of cellulitis while they were an inpatient um, and offering them an, an evidence-based intervention to reduce their risks. Um, alongside that, then we hoped that we would be able to create a patient reported outcome measure as well um, and within that our main things really were around education and raising awareness so making the patients more aware of what cellulitis was and how they could manage it and reduce those risks and make healthcare professionals aware of what it was how it could be managed the best ways to manage it acutely and the best ways to reduce those risks so that was our aim uh, when we set up the service next slide please so this is what we've done so far. We've contacted patients from 10 hospitals. So what we do is we get the data from the hospitals and, and our initial data from each hospital is for the last two years. So the first hospital we, we had was Princess of Wales and they sent us the data for all patients who had been admitted within the last two years and been given a diagnosis so a code while they were in of cellulitis. Um, and then we sent out letters to all those people. So We've now done that for 10 hospitals, um, over five health boards. Uh, we've just sent out our letters to our sixth health board now, so that's so the North Wales hospitals, Betsy Cadwallader, they've just had their, their first um, cohort of letters. And what happens in that is we send them a letter, we send them this leaflet that you can see on the side. This is a copy of the leaflet that they get with the letter, sort of explaining to them a little bit about um, what cellulitis is, because some of them don't recognise that they've heard that word before, even if they've had cellulitis, and ask them to contact us to make a, an appointment to have a clinical in interaction with us. Um, you can see our response rates there, which we're really pleased with. Um, it's just under half and from a cold contact with you know, something that they've no idea they were going to receive. Uh, we're really pleased. You can see that in some hospitals, you know, Singleton, Neath, but Talbot and um, uh, with the bush were up to closer towards 60 percent. The lowest one is the Heath, so UHW, um, where it was 39 percent. And, and our opinion was that the Heath is obviously a tertiary centre. An awful lot of people who, who don't just live in Cardiff, but who live in and around uh, Wales uh, will get admitted there with very significant health problems. And for lots of those people with their multiple comorbidities or significant medical events, they they the cellulitis that they had while they were in there might have been a very minor part of, of that health event. And that is possibly why we didn't get quite such a good response from there. What happens as well is that we send out that two years. So Princess of Wales had those letters back in sort of June, July 2020. And then what we do is every six months we go back again and we say, right, send us the last six months. Then, so since you've heard from us last, give us the last six months. So what that means is anybody who didn't contact us in that first cohort, if they've been readmitted since and they, you know, and they didn't choose to respond to our letter the first time, they'll get another letter. So another little reminder to see if we can persuade them to get in touch with us. So we're not missing those people who don't respond to it the first time. If they get readmitted, they will end up getting another letter. So it's a, it's a big hit the first time because it's two years worth of data. But then after that, um, we contact them every six months and we get the, the refreshed bit of who's been in since then. OK, so next slide, please. OK, so this is looking at our sort of occurrences. Um, so on average, the We've had 1,500 people go through the the the, um, the service entirely now. So that means um, we've sent them a letter, they've responded to the letter, we've spoken to them, we've arranged to see them if we needed to do. Uh, we've reviewed them again a few months later, we've referred them on to other people. And there's an awful lot of patients that are currently going through that, so they're not completed yet. So of the 1,150 that have completed um, a course of activity with us now, they had between them about 2,700 episodes of cellulitis. So, uh, you know, two and a half um, episodes each on average, and their length of stay was about five days. Um, the location of the swelling is what we would expect. Um, all the evidence would say that whilst you can get cellulitis anywhere, the vast majority of people will get it in their lower limbs. So 74% getting them in their lower limb, 50-50 male and female. Um, and as Karen's slides alluded to and Marie's, um, these are people who are over the age of 60, um, get more vulnerable, more frail, um, and, and it's affecting their lives quite significantly. So if I can have the next slide, please. So this is the big bit for me. This is that this is where we have our impact. So what we're trying to do in all of this is find out, yes, you've had cellulitis, but why did you have it and what has caused it? And is it reversible? Can we do something about it? Can we intervene and advise you how to intervene or intervene directly ourselves to reduce the risk of you having that second infection? So we ask them, the patients on the phone when they ring back in, do you know what caused it? Was there an obvious cause? Were you bitten by something? Had you scratched your leg? Did you have a wound? Had you fallen over? Those kind of things. And so the big ones are wounds. 34% of the people who were admitted to hospital had a wound at that time. A big proportion didn't know where it was, where it came from. But again, this is reported by the patients. 
And then we've got the, the sort of smaller numbers of people who are post-op or who've had a trauma um, who've been bitten by insects, quite, quite a common one as well, or, or have got chronic um, skin conditions, you know, and there's a flare-up of that. So we try and find out what it was that caused it. And then when we see them, when we meet them, we look at those causes. So if they've got wounds and ulcers, who's managing it? How are you managing it? You're just sticking a plaster on yourself, which an awful lot of people are. Oh, I just do it myself. The nurses used to come and I've got a few things left, so I, I use what I've got. No, that's not right. We need to get you under the right people. So we'll start the treatment and then we'll get on to the district nurses and the um, tissue viability nurse and the practice nurses and get them involved in the care. So they're getting the right treatment. When we see people who've got dry skin conditions, simple eczemas, things like that, we'll speak to the GPs to make sure that they're getting the right treatment for that. Um, then the GPs ultimately may, may refer them on to dermatologists if we think it's that significant, but it's just basic management. And then this core group of people that we see who have fungal infections, very basic fungal infections, athlete's foot that most people will ignore if they have it, mightn't even know they have it. But the risk when you have a break in your skin in, in between your toes that you mightn't even be able to see, um, depending on your age and how, how mobile you are and how much you can bend, that that is a break in your skin that is providing an opportunity for bacteria to get through. Um, and so being able to treat that condition, um, offer some topical treatment or get some systemic treatment from the GP if that's what we need so that these things are being reversed. Um, an awful lot of these patients, and I'll go into a bit more detail about lymphedema in the next slide, have swelling, uh, an awful lot of them not being not being treated for that. Over half are obese, um, a, a large proportion of diabetic, a large proportion taking blood pressure medications, some of which will, will cause some of the swelling that they have. And as with Karen's score earlier, um, frail, quite frail people, not quite as frail as the on the ground project because all those patients are being visited by district nurses, so they're all housebound. Our patients were, were, were working and active as well as, as being um, uh, frail too, but a large proportion of them in those frailer groups, 43% with a, a, um, a score of greater than four. So if you do the next slide for me, please. So lymphedema. So this was, we knew this would be a big um, cohort of people. Um, we were well aware that we we weren't seeing everybody who was getting cellulitis as a lymphedema service. We knew we could make an impact on these people, but we knew we were missing them. So when, when it came down to it, nearly half of the patients that we saw had some sort of lymphedema, yet only yet 60% of them weren't known. So of that half that we saw that had swelling, 60% of them were not known to the lymphedema services. So there was a big gap there. Uh, and we were able to then intervene to start them off in compression to get them managing their their swelling to acknowledge that they had swelling in the first place some of them but to get them then managing their swelling and, and, and undertaking the, the treatments that they need to do and then referring them on to the local services for ongoing management uh, when they were already primed. So that was lovely. By the time the services get them, they would generally already be in compression. They would be well aware of their skin care. They would be well, of the, well aware of the fact that they needed to, to lose weight um, and, and keep active and keep moving. Um, we do identify people who meet the criteria for prophylactic antibiotics. So if you've had a cellulitis infection and then you've had another one, so if you've had two cellulitis infections in a 12 month, you would meet the criteria for prophylactic antibiotics. So we would dig down a bit further when we, when we, if we saw that data with patients, we would speak to them a bit more, find out a bit more of the history of that. Were they true cellulitis that they were having? Were you definitely having cellulitis? Um, and, it, and if they were, they would meet the criteria. And only about half of the ones that should have been were on prophylactic antibiotics. So being on prophylactic antibiotics, all the evidence would say that whilst you take prophylactic antibiotics, your risks of having a reinfection are really, really low. Um, you don't need to be on it for very long, um, and I'll go on to that a bit more in a minute, but you, whilst you're on prophylactic antibiotics, your risks reduce significantly. Um, and so we've got about half of that number, that 5% who, who weren't on prophylaxis, we've got them onto that. So the main things that we're looking at are what are your risks? Can we reverse them? How can we reverse them? And over to you to do it to the patient. So we give them all advice about what cellulitis is, why they got it, why we think they got it. And then we get them doing basics like skincare, washing, drying, moisturising their skin, getting in between their toes, making sure they're drying properly advising them on why it is so vital to move and what part of their system is moving when they are and how if they're moving and keeping active that fluid is being moved around their body and they're no longer sitting there with sort of stagnant fluid in their legs that's just pooling. Um, the relationship between weight is really important for patients to be aware that as they gain weight not only will their swelling deteriorate, it, it maps almost entirely in a correlation, but they're also more vulnerable to infection. So the patients need to be aware that if they can take some ownership of their weight and make some impact, positive impacts there, their, their odds of getting an infection are, are being reduced too. And wearing compression, 
um, the, the research would show that if you're wearing compression, so your lymphedema is controlled, your edema is controlled, your odds of getting an infection are significantly reduced. It doesn't have to be gone, it just needs to be being controlled. So if we can get the right compression on you and get you compliant wearing it, your odds of getting an infection are significantly uh, reduced. So if I can have the next one, please. So we also created a, a prom, you're, you're prommed, I'm sure you're well aware of your proms. We've created a cell you prom. So this is similar to the limb prom. It's got 12 um, questions as opposed to the 13. Um, and as you can see here, all of them, again, uh, decreased. The big ones for me in this are the fear and anxiety. It's what I've always uh, found with these patients is that when we see them, they all talk about how scary it was to get the infection. They'd never had it before. It came on very quickly. They didn't know what it was. And before they knew where they were, they were in hospital. Uh, they were quite unwell. And particularly at the minute, they couldn't have visitors. So, you know, these are quite unwell. Um, words like sepsis and sepsisemia are being used and patients are then repeating these. I was septic. I was, you know, so quite frightening terminology for them. Um, and then they and then they get discharged and yes, it's gone. But then they're thinking, well, well why, why is it not going to come back again? You know, why would it not? Um, am I going to be all right? Can I go on holiday? What if I'm not home when it happens? What if I'm on my own when it happens? Uh, what if it's a Sunday night and I've got no one to contact? So that was what we've targeted an awful lot um, is by sort of reinforcing to them that if you know what it felt like, if you can remember those symptoms and they all can how it felt then you know that it's really important to get help quickly so if you notice those um, symptoms at seven o'clock on a friday night then you need to contact out of hours you don't wait till monday morning you contact the out of hours and you get help quickly and then you start your antibiotic course sooner and then the chances are you won't need the admission if your skin is in good condition, if you're being active, if you're wearing your compression, if you're on your long term antibiotics because, you know, because you've met the criteria, the odds of you having that infection have significantly decreased. So you feel a bit more in control um, of, of that risk. Then we always are very clear. Of course, we can't guarantee you're never going to get another cellulitis. We wouldn't profess to have a magic wand, but we know that we can make it significantly less likely. And this is all by just empowering patients to do these things themselves. It's, they don't need us to hold their hand doing this. We give them the guidance and they can do that for themselves. Next slide, please. What we've created alongside this is a pathway for people with um, cellulitis and, and lymphedema in Wales. Um, and we already had one of these. We've um, this, we already had a cellulitis guidance for people with lymphedema. But what we've done is we've we've tweaked it and we've augmented it a bit and added to it. So if you show the next slide. Um, what we have done is we've got more of a sort of commentary alongside of it then. So more about is it really cellulitis, um, more of a red flag system? Um, what is cellulitis, the, the new scores and things like that, excluding differential diagnosis of, of deep vein from the thrombosis and things like that. So it comes with this then. And then the third page, if you go into the next page for me, uh, this is the algorithm that you've got. So the one on the left is the what should we do if somebody needs prophylactic antibiotics? So then what we've changed here is that it used to be that we would advise people taking these long term antibiotics for about a year. Um, and now we've with, with um, support from the All World Antimicrobial Group. So they've been um, key in instrumental in, in creating these guidance with us. Um, we've decided that six months is long enough. So if you take your prophylactic antibiotics for six months and you don't have another episode, you do not need to keep to continuing taking the antibiotics. It's safe for you to stop. We also want you to be reviewed regularly within that period. And that's new in this guidance. So it's sort of one month and three months. We want you to be having a conversation with somebody from the cellulitis service like me or with your GP. How are you feeling? Have you had any more? Um, have you had any more need to have an acute um, treatment for any cellulitis? Because if people are having recurrent breakthrough, if they're taking a long term antibiotic and yet they're still getting admitted to hospital, somebody needs to recognise that and think, well, maybe it's not the right one. Um, and then you can use your, your antimicrobial people, your people in microbiology to find out maybe there is a better antibiotic for them, not the conventional one. Maybe there is a better one and there are suggestions for that on there. Uh, so you might go off piste and, and try a different antibiotic to see if you can get this, um, this chronic infection under control. And to the right hand side then is just the acute treatment of a cellulitis and the recommended um, antibiotics and course of treatment um, that you should be having. So for people with swelling, you need a slightly longer course of treatment than for those without. Um, and then what to do if it doesn't improve. And if so, if you're not seeing improvement at 48 hours, should you be switching antibiotics when you should be admitting things like that? OK, um, next slide, please. We have also created um, as part of the cellulitis team a 
uh, e-learning tool. So uh, uh, there's one that's ready for professionals on ESR um, and that uses a video film that we've created and questions uh, to inform to inform healthcare professionals about cellulitis. So there's a ESR e-learning tool and there is a, a video that I'm hoping we'll show a clip of at the end now. So these we've got lots of films in, in lymphedema, all made by Pocket Medic, all accessible for all of our patients. Um, and there's, there's films on everything from what compression guides are to um, what skin care is, what's good skin care, what's a good diet, what does a good diet look like? And then we've just created this one on cellulitis. And so these films are really powerful for patients because they're just about um, somebody that looks like them, somebody that is them, talking to them about how they're managing their risks. Um, so they're available for everybody to look at. And last slide, I think for me then. Oh, this could be the film, is it? Is this going to be the film? Yeah. Oh no, this is the last slide, sorry, the last slide. Um, so what I've been talking about so far is all about secondary care. So then as a service, we, we're looking more at primary care. We know that primary care have an awful lot of people with cellulitis. I think the latest research I saw showed that um, 18% of all prescriptions written outside of secondary care are for someone with cellulitis. So that's second only to respiratory tract infections. It's a really common reason for GPs to be seeing patients. The events appear that you can see are, you know, the 80,000 patients, that is the N number, 80,000 patients are attending GPs for um, cellulitis. Um, that's causing 217,000, over 200,000 GP events. So that could be someone writing a script, someone seeing a practice nurse. Um, so it's an awful lot of cost um, for, for um, GPs. Um, and the graphs that you can see down the bottom here, we're, we're able to access data that is all Wales, that is health board centred and that is individual practice centred. And so we, we know of um, lots of our practices can then look at how their, their antibiotic use is and there's a particular GP practice uh, that we're helping to support who had 12 patients on repeat flu clock. So a pharmacist had gone in and done an audit on their on their antimicrobial prescribing and found 12 patients mistakenly on repeat flu cloxacillin, which meant that every month they were getting flu cloxacillin, whether they wanted it or not, whether they took it or not, we don't know. Um, an awful lot of patients having two courses in the in the last year of flucloxacillin, an awful lot having three courses, and so even having four courses for acute flu um, flucloxacillin, so acute cellulitis. And so we are going to into that GP surgery now to offer contacts with all of those patients to see how can we reverse these risks, how can we make this uh, better for them. As you can imagine, um, these patients are more vulnerable in the more deprived areas. The two sit alongside each other. So if you're in a more deprived area of Wales, you're more likely to be admitted uh, with cellulitis. Um, and if you're of an older age, you're more likely to be admitted um, with cellulitis. So that's that's as we would expect. So if by the miracle of technology now, we may be able to show the video film. Cellulitis is a bacterial infection of the skin which occurs deeper down in the layers of the skin and treated can have potentially quite severe complications. When it happens to you, you, you will understand where I'm coming from. Tim has mastered the art of self-management to keep himself largely infection free. I've got these stockings, I swear by them. So you wear your stockings every day? Don't leave home without them. By the end of each day, it used to go massive again. So these stockings that they supplied me with, this unit now, has really, really helped. So, you know, if you have got the stockings, wear them. Some people with recurrent infections will take a daily low dose of antibiotics as a preventative measure. It's worked for Philip, who sees a lymphedema therapist regularly after treatment for bone cancer. I have had one reoccurrence of cellulitis but I was getting it regularly every six or seven weeks. Clinics like this across Wales are sharing best practice to try and prevent people being hospitalised, and for good reason. If you get this, trust me, wear the stockings, use the moisturiser. If you think you're getting it, contact your doctor and get it checked out. So that was just um, a small clip, just a couple of minute clip from, from what is about a 10 minute film, uh, but we thought it was really powerful and good. So listen to Tim is what I say. If you don't listen to me, listen to Tim. Um, so I'm going to hand you back now to, to Dr. Melanie Thomas, um, who will carry on talking about Project B. Um, trust me to, to mess it up. 
But never mind. So it's back to me and I'm going to talk about Project B. And you might think, why is it called Project B? Well, Project A failed. So B was the next on the alphabet. So what can I tell you about Project B? So basically, if you've got swelling, if you've got edema, you need to wear compression because it's the compression that is the mainstay of treatment and it will prevent that swelling getting worse and it will actually reduce it. But the problem is there's thousands of them, thousands of different varieties, colours, zips, no zips, extra wide calf, extra wide thigh, long foot, short foot. You imagine there's hundreds and some people get it wrong. So lots of mess up factors but it costs money. Now, as you can imagine, in Wales, different people had different services and we all had different discounts. I'm quite vocal. So obviously, when I worked in Swansea Bay, we had the best discount because I was very much saying I need a little bit more off. However, maybe colleagues in North who were a little bit quieter, they didn't get as good discounts. But that isn't great for Wales when we've got one purse. So let's try and get everybody the right discount. Next slide, please. So what did we do? There must be a prudent way for this. So we met with all the clinicians, we met with NHS shared services and what we did, we got all of the manufacturers of these compression garments together and we said, OK, if we wanted a lightweight, lightweight below knee stocking, what's your products that would meet that lot? And then what we did, we involved SMTL. SMTL Surgical Materials Testing Laboratory. And what they do is they test to see if a product does what it says on the package. So if it says it should be class one and it should be 18 to 21 milligrams per mercury, is that what it is? Is it actually 15 milligrams, which is too low, or is it 26, which would be too high? And to be honest, we opened up a massive can of worms when we did this. And my colleagues and I, we had to wear um, bulletproof vests when we ever went to a conference because all the manufacturers were all like, oh my gosh, what has she done? But actually what we've done is we've shown that in Wales, we can ensure it's the best outcome. So it's the best product that does the right thing, but also it's standardised and it was the best money, so the best price. So we came up with this all Wales lymphedema compression garment formulary, and that was for secondary care and primary care. Now, those four stockings, you might think, well, they're all different sizes, but actually we gave four different manufacturers the same measurements to come up with a made to measure garment. And as you can see on your screen, they are vastly different and that's the problem. There is tolerances within certain products and that is made to measure and I'll come back to that a bit later. Next slide. So could we do something different? Now we have this formulary, we have this NHS Wales con uh, contract and we actually won a patient safety award for it, which is great. But a lot of the garments that we were issuing came from prescriptions. So they actually came from medicines management. They came from primary care and we were in secondary care. So we thought, well, in Wales, we go with this one pot of money. Why can't we get the best value for our money? So the best for the back. Next slide, please. So that's what we did. So the old way was. I go to my lymphedema service, I need a compression garment. My therapist would write to my GP to say, I've seen Melanie, um, she actually needs XY garment, please can you prescribe it? I would then go to my GP, I would pick up the prescription, I would then take it to my pharmacy. My pharmacist would then order the garment from the manufacturer and then they would give me a ring six weeks possibly later to say your garment's now in Mel. I would then get my garment and I'd contact the lymphedema service to say I've got my garment, can I now come back in and you can fit it? What a waste of time. What value is that for me as the patient? And think about, you know, you know, obviously in Glasgow last week, we had lots of things about climate change. Look at all the travel that everybody's got to do and also look at the process where errors could occur. So what we said was Project B is one purse. Give us the money, show us the money. We will order the garment from the medicine management budget and we will guarantee that it's right. And actually, it's a streamlined process. So you would think straight away, oh my gosh, it's, it's a no brainer. Everybody needs to do this. But we did face quite a lot of obstacles. 
but we eventually agreed, yes, we would trial it out in a few health boards. Next slide, please. So what did we need to collect? Well, we needed to prove that it would work. We wanted the quality of care. Was it right for patients? Um, how many patients got it wrong? How many were new? How many were follow ups? How many were on the contract? How many were off contract? Does it matter? Was the length of time better? Because we knew it takes on average six weeks. What errors were there? And revenue. How much money does it cost? Now, when you think about it, although we've got a, an NHS contract, so we know it's the best value, the best money, we've got to add VAT on it because prescription routes don't add VAT. So we knew it had to be 20% cheaper to even get it on even keel. Next slide, please. So we didn't look at a thousand patients. We didn't look at a hundred. We looked at 5,392 because we really wanted to prove our worth. We picked on, not picked on, but we used two health boards. They would say, yes, we picked on them, but 64% from one health board and 36% from another. And of those 5,392 patient audit forms, it would actually equate it to over 10,000 garments. And that was two garments per patient. Lower limbs, 84%, then you had upper limbs, 14, but there was other products, wraps, truncal products, so like breast bands, uh, genital shorts and applicators. 47% were flat knitted and what that means is they were made flat, they're then sewn together, whereas 49% were circular knit and that means they're made on a machine and they're circular, okay? Flat knit, you can only get on prescription as a made to measure, which is twice the cost as we could buy a flat knit ready to wear from secondary care. 18% were new, 82% were follow-ups, but of that, 52% were now fitted on the day, 41% had to be ordered. That's still not great. I'm sure we could do better, but obviously there's lots of stock and where are you going to hold that stock? But importantly, 71% of those new patients had that garment on the day that they were seen and then they went away with that garment on, with that treatment. And, you know, you often think, Karen, who you spoke earlier, she's got asthma. Can you imagine going to the GP and saying, yes, you need a ventral inhaler. However, it's going to take six to eight weeks for it to come. But, you know, where's the compliance with that? You know, suddenly you think, well, the GP can't think it's that important. I've got to wait six to eight weeks. Whereas now we're given this compression garment there and then. And importantly, again, 92% were on contract, so we knew we were getting the best value. Next slide, please. So what else can I tell you about these results? Well, of the patients that had to be ordered, so remember now, there was 50% that were collected from the service, 32% were posted. However, 18% had to come back in for a fit-in. However, compare that to the, the old prescription route where it was 80% had to come back in. So we are saving money with wasted prescriptions as well, you know, wasted time to come back and follow ups. The time for the orders, some garments took 11 days to come. And the main reason for that was down to administrators. Now, remember, we didn't have administrators doing all the ordering because it used to go to uh, the the prescribers, so your prescription clerk, the GPs. So that's why we said, if we're going to do this nationally, we have to have a band three administrator who can do a lot of this work for us. Non-contracts took slightly longer than those on contract. Made to measures took 14 days and ready to wear took 10 days. But really vitally, 100% of patients had the right garment. So there was no waste, no mess up factors. Next slide, please. So what about the money? So what I can tell you is if you've got a garment and it was on the prescription, same garment, £55.60. If you got it through Project B, through secondary care, even with VAT, it was £40.40. When you add in staff costs, now I know you can't save on staff costs, but we could say, you know, GPs, this is a waste of time. There's no value for them in doing this. So you could be doing something else. Suddenly it went to £78 with prescription route versus £41.50 with Project B. And when you looked at all of those garments, the 5,392 patients, the 10,000 garments, suddenly we're saving about 383,000. Next slide, please. So 
discussion, yeah, there's huge benefits for doing this. You know, there's the loss of the travel for the patient, making sure we get it 100% right. They haven't got to worry about car parking. You come to the clinic, you're given the garment for the majority of patients, decreased waste, time and variation, and it's a streamlined uh, process completely. Now, when you think about how much garments are used in the UK, suddenly it makes a lot more sense for money because 40 million pounds is spent on compression garments in the UK now and that's prescription so could we save or how much could we save if we did it that way next slide please so conclusion there are some limitations obviously we use PSSR uh, costings that is personal social research costings for the staff um, we didn't cost in the follow-up appointments we didn't cost in the postage but we didn't also cost in the the travel for uh, patients how, where and where they went but there is substantial savings and it's a much better service for patients and we have submitted an article so next slide. So that is project B. So I'm very briefly going to tell you now about some bits of our benefit realisation. Next slide. So in Wales, what we've got is an evaluation framework and with our objectives, obviously we're trying to meet those objectives by different initiatives that we can do. As you can probably tell by the previous four presentations, we do collect a lot of data. And if you don't collect data, there is no problem. So which is why it's vital that you do collect data. So the first one, equitable lymphedema services. Back in 2019, the therapist to patient ratio was 600 and 663 patients to one therapist. That's now gone down to 325, much more manageable. And we've got limited breaches for new patients across Wales. All patients receive intensive treatment. Intensive treatment is what Karen said about the bandaging. You know, it's vital that these patients receive what they need. And it was really great before the pandemic, we'd actually increased from 4,000 and 80 intensive treatments per annum up to 5,400. However, due to the pandemic, obviously, you know, we were prioritising who was coming in. We didn't close, we were still open, but that went down. But I'm pleased to say that is now increasing. Cellulitis episodes, Linda's already told you, lots of cellulitis events happen in GP surgeries. And I'm delighted to say that we're doing a project in Howell Var, um, working on two clusters in Llanelli and Amon Valley and Gwendraith, where we are now going into services, into GP services to really upskill and see those patients who are having those repeat attacks. And hopefully we can come back and tell you about that again next year. With regards to admissions, yes, we've now seen the 6,000 people who've been admitted last year. There's lots more work to be done there, but I can tell you the data is suggesting that we are making a difference. Next slide, please. So the other things to look at, waste, harm and variation, I've just briefly told you about Project B. Six of the seven health boards are now doing Project B. We've just got the one last one to go and they are halfway there um, because they already do it to an extent. Um, the other things to add, Limprom. Limprom has taken off like we never thought it would. And that's one positive from COVID really, and especially using digitalised platforms as well. Um, the efficiencies in community nurses, OGEP. OGEP is live in four health boards, which is hoping the next three will follow on because as Karen said, it actually costs more to not do it than to put those posts in place. And lastly, education. Yeah, we are raising awareness. That does cause problems because we end up with more patients. But do you know what? If we can do e-learning, we can do virtual sessions. Uh, and in 2021, in the midst of the pandemic, we still taught uh, 300 learners on lymphedema uh, awareness and knowledge courses. So that's our benefit realisation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go back now to Tim to say really lessons learned. OK, if I go to the next slide, please. OK, so this is interesting. We're looking back now on what has been you know, quite clear to be a very successful um, uh, project, but we did experience some major financial challenges along the way. And the first one was identifying the funding to start the investment. A lot of the savings that we've talked about were non-cash releasing 
Um, and there was great timing differences between when the intervention would start and when the cash would be uh, released to allow us to invest. So we had some, we had, we had, to, had to go and try and beg and borrow for the pump prime in initially to, uh, to, to get the, uh, the benefits that Mellon and the team have talked about today. And it's interesting, how do you quantify and value a benefit that's not cash releasing. And as I said earlier, you know, uh, we've got some of our general hospitals nearly falling over. What is the benefit for us to take pressure off them? It's probably more than the actual cost in itself. And how do we uh, how do we quantify and value an improved patient outcome? That was a bit of a challenge. And how do we ensure the allocation or reallocation of resources to put support service pathways is not impacted by traditional budget structures. And what I mean there is the way this project runs is often you need to invest in perhaps primary care or in the community to deliver savings in another budget heading with a different budget holder. And those challenges are still something we've had to grapple with and we continue to grapple with now. Um, I think the discussions are getting far more mature but our traditional budget structures are not helping because people are, are performance managed often on their little budget uh, and not in a system wide with a system wide view. And we've got to try and look at ways to navigate that. Next slide, please. So the lessons learned. Um, explore external and internal funding sources for pump priming, transformation funding, invest to save, seek out non-recurrence and uh, recurrent slippage from in your development. I'm aware this year there's, uh, there is a lot of slippage due to us not being able to recruit. The, where we need pump priming, we've got to go looking for that to try and get these sort of value-based schemes up and running. One of the key lessons as well is quantify and value both the non-financial benefit uh, and the way we've done this is if we can reduce cellulitis inpatient bed days by 365, we can then talk about a, uh, an opportunity of one bed. Uh, and we can va and put a value to that. And I think we need to try and talk in opportunity costs as well as financial costs. Uh, Number one here, agree a baseline activity and a cost at the outset uh, with all budget holders. So if I give you a quick example, Mel talked about Project B. Um, she was going to uh, make savings in the primary care, uh, on the primary care budget and in secondary care uh, drug spe uh, medicine spend. Uh, however, to, to do this, uh, transformation funding was used. The transformation money was non-recurring. When Mel needs money now to put the sustainable solution in, the savings were already eaten up by medicines management and we had some uh, difficult discuss discussions there. Don't forget to build ser uh, service growth into calculations, otherwise the growth way may uh, mask achieved expenditure reductions. If you're going to get a cohort of patients growing by 5% every year, don't be surprised if some of the savings you had originally forecast didn't materialize. The message here is if you didn't do the intervention, those growth would have happened and the costs would have been greater. And we need to make sure that we, we, we capture both uh, when we do any business case or when we do any assessment. Probably the one that Mel is best of, uh, best at. If the system is preventing you from doing the right thing, then escalate. Now I know Mel was so passionate about what she did. She had managed to get um, Dr. Andrew Goodall, head of NHS Wales, um, to help her intervene, and, and and it got to that level, and he did intervene, and we had this is part of the reason why we're here now. I'm not suggesting that. Um, every value-based project ends up on the, on the doorstep of the new uh, director general. But I think, you know, if the systems are getting in the way, the budgetary systems are getting in the way, we need to escalate it to a level. I've noticed over the last couple of months, 
we are making progress. We're only having to meet myself and Mel are meeting with directors of finance now, not people in Welsh Government. And I'm hoping as the years progress and people understand the value that these projects uh, deliver, the uh, budget holders at a lower level will start to, to engage and, uh, and lead to doing the right thing. Um, and then I think this is exactly what we're doing today. Monitor and measure financial and non-financial benefits alongside the patient outcome information and communicate results with all stakeholders. Tell the story of the successes because it's that is going to get the message out to people that this is the right thing to do and doing the right thing needs to be spread across Wales. And I think that's where I hand over. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'll hand over to Craig now who's going to talk about uh, another bit of financial work we, we've been doing. OK, that's great. Thanks, Tim. Um, so Tim mentioned, my name is Craig Davey. Um, I'm a programme manager on Value Based Healthcare um, in the Finance Delivery Unit. Um, in this final section, uh, I'm just going to talk to you um, a bit of a brief overview, really, of um, a piece of costing work that we're doing. Um, as, a, as part of this project and in collaboration with Lymphedema Wales colleagues and, and with the National Steering Group. Um, so it's a piece of work, sorry, next slide, please. Um, so this is a piece of work um, that we're undertaking to look at the costs associated with the lymphedema pathway across organisations in Wales. And we're doing this then in parallel with the role of the National Proms Programme um, that you've seen earlier. Um, and it's part of a piece of work looking at how we can maybe explore more standardised clinical pathways then across Wales. So we're essentially undertaking here an all Wales costing exercise, um, looking at the various lymphedema pathways in place across Wales, so across seven health boards, um, using time driven activity based costing to uh, look at how, I suppose, resources are used then locally in the delivery of care um, at each point within the pathway. And we've broken this down into, into two phases. So phase one is focusing on really understanding the structure of the local teams and the local service models or pathways that are in place um, across each health board and then looking really at the direct staffing input um, involved in delivering care at each step. So as I've got on the slide there, it's looking at essentially who does what, when and for how long um, at each point in that pathway. Phase two then we'll focus on looking at the, the volumes of activity um, at each step in the pathway. So allowing us to start looking at really the allocation of the remaining and, and the more sort of indirect, I suppose, staffing costs um, and start to understand then the patient flows within the pathway um, as part of that. And I'll come back to this in a little bit more detail um, in one of my later slides. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so this second slide just gives you a, a quick overview really of um, what is a slightly simplified version of the pathway at the moment that we're trying to cost. And this goes from sort of initial patient referral um, on the left um, in the red box there um, through the triage initial assessment and then the various sort of follow up groups that that patients could follow, focusing really on those activities then that are delivered or would be delivered by um, local lymphedema teams as part of that service delivery. Um, and with this being an all Wales exercise, you know, we want to make sure that the outputs allow us to then compare sort of apples with apples, so to speak. Um, and that's why we've been sort of basing the work around this slightly more simplified sort of standard pathway um, in terms of the key steps. And we'll then try to implement the costing uh, methodology in a way um, that we're hopefully able to capture any sort of key, I suppose, variations or nuances um, in the delivery of the pathway across health boards while then still delivering outputs that will allow us to make comparisons at that all Wales level, if that makes sense. Um, and this is something we're trying to really test as part of that phase one output that I that I just described. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this slide just very quickly touches a bit more on some of the TDABC analysis in a bit more detail um, as part of that phase one and phase two work that I mentioned mentioned about. So um, as you mentioned, the phase one work is focusing really on understanding um, the, the structure of the local teams and the, and the local service models um, and then the direct staffing input involved at each step in the pathway. And the idea with this is that we'll be, it will start to give us really, I suppose, a first layer of costs, so to speak, um, focusing on variation in that direct staffing input. And that will then essentially um, be driven by a combination of both timing input and staff bandings, et cetera, um, across the different elements of the pathway. So we can start to look at where we're seeing some of this variation, um, start measuring and quantifying it then to an extent and start looking at why this why this might be the case. Um, and then the phase two bit then, so the, the sort of um, third and fourth bullet points there, um, we'll start to look at the patient volumes and patient flows in the pathway to start looking at full staffing costs as well, um, which will be building on the analysis we'll have done in phase one, um, and in some sense, giving us almost a second layer, if you like, of, of costs 
that will give us some further insights then into the um, I suppose the efficiency with which resources are being utilised across the pathway and identify then any potential opportunities around things such as unused capacity, for example. Um, and I suppose this will then hopefully allow us to continue exploring any areas of unwarranted variation um, and look at where we can potentially improve the you know, value for patients, um, essentially looking at the, the so what around all of this. Um, and I suppose ultimately it's, it's looking at you know how we can use these findings then alongside um, outcomes data that I mentioned earlier um, to support the thinking then around the development of an optimum workforce um, and or service model um, and understand what this could mean then for the future delivery of lymphedema services across Wales and, and this could hope this hopefully then all ties in quite nicely with the things you've seen already and some of the great work that's going on as part of this as part of the wider project. Um, so next slide please. That's just as the last slide for me and it's just a quick um, overview really a run through of the, what we've um, sort of what we've done to date and then kind of where we're going with some of the next steps really. Um, so we've currently um, in the final stages of completing the phase one outputs and we have draft outputs at the moment for six of the seven health boards um, with the final health board we didn't I think it's due to take place in the next few weeks um, with that one and we're also in conversation then with lymphedema Wales colleagues to start exploring how we can bring in some of the activity data I know Mel mentioned earlier you know there's, there's loads of activity data and um, patient data that they capture as part of the service and we'll be looking at how we can start to use that then um, to support some of the work in scoping and developing the, the phase two um, part of this project, if you like. So next steps then in terms of going forward, we'll be looking to feedback um, some of the initial phase one findings to the lymphedema steering group um, to start then progressing some of those initial conversations really on the findings and start to collectively understand um, and interpret these in a bit more detail. Um, at the same time, we'll be looking to start exploring the, I suppose, the, the, the developing really the scope um, and start working through the phase two um, element of the project then, as I've just described above. Um, alongside the cost and work then, sort of, I suppose, beyond the phase two, we'll be starting to look at how we kind of bring this information together alongside the outcomes data um, and really start visualising value. So this will include using things like maybe radar charts or rank tables, for example, um, to start really comparing service models and pathways then using a range of different measures, which, um, as I mentioned above, will include both cost and outcomes then, so really starting to have those, those value-based sort of um, conversations. Um, and then beyond this really is just looking at how we can start to use this information both now and sort of into the future really to help to sort of drive and support, as I mentioned, that sort of value-based decision making and in developing lymphedema services across Wales and, and doing this in a way that continues to drive really the, the best outcomes for patients while, while maximising then the use of, of the resources that we have available. Um, so that's it from me in terms of the slides. I think the next slide, sorry, I think I'm going to hand back to Mel then just to, to wrap things up and uh, Go on to the Q&A then. Me again. Thanks so much for your whistle stop tour of lymphedema services in Wales. As you can imagine, we have lots more that we could share and we've only picked on sort of five different areas uh, that's currently going on. But watch this space. We've got things looking at heart failure, uh, pregnancy and lots of other things. So we've had a number of questions coming in. Um, so the first one, Karen, if you could take this question, um, how has the pandemic affected your work and has it offered unexpected opportunities? So that's for Karen. Thanks, Mel. Yeah, it has actually, surprisingly. So many of the um, national team were deployed to support other services throughout Wales, but also deployed to other areas. So it opened up even more collaborations, which might be scary for those areas that we went to actually, because we collaborate with everybody. So it did offer those opportunities. It also offered us an opportunity to understand other people's roles, which I think is really essential. Um, and it pushed us into the virtual world. So for, for our patients, um, we continue to see patients with lymphedema. As Mel mentioned earlier, we um, although we deployed some of the staff, we still maintained and run the services, which was essential, I think, because a lot of these complexities would have been significantly worse if we weren't seeing those patients. Lots of services weren't able to do that, so we were lucky to be in that um, position. But the technology allowed us to, um, those who feared it then, 
were a little bit resistant to it to push you into using it straight away. So it pushed that forward. So we would do telephone triage with the patient and then offer and attend anywhere if they were a bit concerned about coming into the hospital and also then see the ones with the greatest need. And we've continued that actually, and um, that's improved and reduced burden on patients and services. So I think there's been lots of opportunities opened up by the pandemic, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. And um, the next question that has come in, Marie, if you could take this one. How has the prom and prem you, that we've developed been adopted outside Wales? Um, and have you been able to use it to benchmark with other areas? So Marie. Hi, so thanks for this question. Uh, an interesting one. So and um, it'll overlap a little bit with Saluprom because I know there's another other question about use of Saluprom. So we have had interest in in Limprom um, in lymphedema services um, around the UK. Uh, we're slightly uh, two holds for that. One, um, we're working through intellectual properties, just getting off the, the governance, the sign off for sharing and use. And I touched at the start about validation. So the validation paper will be out soon enough. Um, so that will enable uh, others potentially to use it in line with our, our, our sort of IP. Um, and then the other question is about benchmarking. And I know there's another question um, about um, weighting data and sort of our case mix. And I know there's been sessions on benchmarking throughout. So I think with caution, I will say we're not currently using it to benchmark. Um, there's lots more to do with the data. This is very early days. The dashboard itself is not live yet. Um, watch the space. There will be more sessions on it. Um, the plan will be to triangulate, um, as with many of the problems that have been centralised with existing um, data and databases that are available. So things around um, linking with potentially with BMI, comorbidity. So there's lots, lots more to do. This is just a starting point. Um, so your prom will be to follow, follow in terms of validation and potentially sharing wider then and Limprem again that's kind of the early days our focus has been on Limprom there's not enough of us not enough hours in the day but um, watch this space thanks for the question Back so thanks thanks Marie um, just one question um, with or one question that came in regarding benchmarking with other countries, we're actually presenting LIMPROM in the International Lymphedema Framework in Copenhagen next week. So I dare say we'll probably have lots of countries asking, can they use it? And the other thing to say about benchmarking services, I'm unsure if you're aware, but Wales is one of the international lymphedema framework countries, and we do benchmark our data against places like USA, Australia, Germany, uh, Denmark. So that is ongoing, but it's at its early stages. Wales only joined as a framework um, three years ago, and actually we are representing the UK because there isn't a UK framework. So Wales are, you know, we are leading the way, I guess. So we've had one more question. Let's have a look. Um, will Limprom and Celluprom uh, for use across all health boards? Well, Celluprom is being used and Limprom is being used for all lymphedema services in Wales. If they're not on the digital platform, they are being used uh, in paper copies. And we're hoping that Celluprom will go live with a digital platform December. So watch that space. And Tim, I believe this is one question for you. Um, the greatest learning and is there any sort of similar approaches you could you, you could suggest for any other services? Oh, that's a, a challenging question. Uh, the, the biggest learning for that for me is that the finance profession has to um, try and move away from being a barrier for this. We've got to be the facilitators to make sure uh, there's positive change, and that is a challenge that. I think we're all grappling with, but it needs to happen. That's my first. There's one other thing I would like to say. Um, Project B was an example of um, a positive change that was led by a clinician 
We tried Project B, but with Stoma Care products, and that was led by an accountant, I was one of them, and procurement, and we actually failed. So the biggest learning I've had from this is that I know what you've done with the Project B was the right thing to do for Stoma Care products as well, but we, we lost the argument with the patients because they believed it was all about the money and it wasn't about um, doing the right thing for the patients. And the learning I've got is grab hold of a clinician and walk with the clinician. Don't try to do it on your own because as accountants, we're never going to win the argument. OK, thanks for that, Tim. That's true. I think clinicians do know slightly better than the accountants, but we can't prove the worth unless you're with us. And, and I've got to say, I think, you know, people say, why is lymphedema Wales? You know, why have you done so well, I guess? And that's because we've involved everybody and anybody, especially accountants. Um, I always remember Alan Bray saying, this is really interesting data, Mel. I like that you've done qualitative and quantitative, but we'd like you to present it in a different way. And I think Karen's reply was something like, I'll present it in my bikini if it gets us the money. Um, but he went in a financial way, and that's where Tim came along and, and has helped us no end. So do we have any other questions? I don't think we have. So on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank you for joining us in Value in Health Week and obviously for inviting us uh, for Lymphedema to share some of our work. Our emails, we are on global, so I'm melanie.j.thomas. If you want to contact us about anything, normally when we actually uh, present, somebody in the audience will have a mother or a partner or a dad or an uncle or a gran that's got lymphedema and they'll want to ask us a question. So you're more than welcome. Please just email us and I'm sure we can help you. So thank you very much and I hope you all have a good evening.